the uh, Subcommittee on Telecommunication and Finance's uh, formal inquiry uh, through the hearing process into the issues surrounding management buyouts, other leverage buyouts, and their contribution to ever-increasing levels of corporate debt. This will be the first in a series of comprehensive hearings that will continue once we commence the 101st Congress in 1989. I thought it appropriate to begin this series of hearings with the Chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission, David Ruder. Today, Chairman Ruder, we will ask you to advise the subcommittee with respect to the rules promulgated by the Commission dealing with LBOs. We are interested in knowing how these rules are designed to serve the investing public and the national interest, and how they are administered and enforced by the Commission. We also want you to elaborate on your letter to me dated December 16, 1988, announcing a comprehensive SEC study of LBOs that will, among other things, one, develop additional data on LBOs, two, examine the current status of financi financing arrangements for past transactions, three, assess the exposure of broker-dealers and investment banking firms that help finance these highly leveraged transactions, four, study the reaction of the bond market to LBOs, and five, determine whether the disclosure requirements of Rule 13E3 are adequate, especially with regard to fairness opinions. Indeed, Mr. Chairman, I would like to make two proposals with regard to fairness opinions or fairness letters at the outset. Based on your testimony, it appears that you are interested in pursuing these initiatives. As you know, these are letters that are prepared by investment banks to attest that the price offered by management for the shares of the company is a fair one. Typically, however, the investment bank relies almost exclusively on the limited information about the company supplied by management. And the letter usually states that the firm has made no independent verification of the information. Moreover, two-tiered or, uh, or incentive pricing often exists with regard to some fairness letters. For example, the investment bank may receive $1 million to prepare the letter, but $1.5 million if the deal goes through. My two proposals with regard to fairness letters that uh, I urge the Commission to consider expeditiously. Uh, first, if management is truly undertaking these transactions to maximize value for shareholders, all buyout proposals should be accompanied by at least one fairness opinion prepared by reputable financial advisors who are paid without regard to the success of the buyout and who have no financial stake in the buyout itself. And second, in my judgment, the principle of full disclosure would be better served by providing that the investment bank that prepares the letter has appropriate access to the books, records, premises, and so forth of the company so that it can provide a realistic appraisal of all of the company's holdings, including real estate, which will be carried on the books at below market value. Beyond the realm of fairness letters, there are other issues that I would like to see the Commission pursue. The Commission should consider expanding the scope of Rule 13E3 to include all negotiated buyouts, not merely those undertaken by issuers and their affiliates. Also, the Commission should consider the advisability of instituting civil money penalties for failure to comply with Rule 13E3 in a material way. And finally, the Commission should extend Item 9 on Schedule 13E3 to require the party to provide not only outside reports, opinions, or appraisals, but internal reports as well. Mr. Chairman, I applaud your willingness to express your views on LBOs, not only as they affect specifically the nation's security markets, but also as they affect the economy as a whole. I applaud this universalist approach which you have taken to the issue. Indeed, I believe that the watchword of the congressional hearings on LBOs and related issues must be how these transactions serve our nation's long-term economic interests. How do they make us more productive? How do they make our industries more competitive? How do they enhance our corporate responsiveness to challenges from abroad? It is answers to these questions and others like them that will place LBOs in the proper national setting. 
On the other hand, if we persist in asking only the question, did the SEC make sure that shareholders got a higher price for their stock, we might be creating a generation of wealthier former shareholders, but leaving behind a poorer, less competitive corporate sector. Mr. Chairman, we have to ask ourselves whether the staggering amounts of money that are borrowed today to do an LBO unduly straightjacket our corporate sector. How will these companies fare in an economic downturn? What impact will a downturn have on banks and other federally insured institutions that have invested liberally in highly leveraged transactions? And what about pension funds and other publicly backed institutions? How will they fare? Mr. Chairman, in my judgment, where the government is the ultimate backstop, where it is the insurer or supporter of last resort, the government has an obligation to all of its citizens to undertake its own risk analysis and to limit its own financial exposure. If that means that we may have to place limits on the amounts or percentages of funds that government insured or publicly backed institutions commit to highly leveraged transactions, then we should undertake to do so. As Alexander Hamilton said in the Federalist paper number 11, why has government been instituted at all? Because sometimes the passions of men will not conform to the dictates of reason and justice without constraint. I believe that it is time for us now to look at this major area of public policy and decide whether or not, in fact, there are constraints are adequate in order to accomplish the larger national public goal. The time for opening statement by the chair has expired. The chair now recognizes the uh, gentleman from New Jersey, the ranking uh, minority member, Mr. Rinaldo, and uh, with the thanks of the, uh, of the chair to all members of the subcommittee and all participants to the, uh, in this uh, proceeding, uh, given the uh, proximity of uh, the Christmas season, we uh, appreciate very much your willingness to uh, uh, indulge the subcommittee in this hearing, but we felt that it was very important given the uh, nature of the controversy which has arisen in the wake of the Nabisco case and the interest which the SEC had demonstrated in working on this issue with us that we lay out uh, the issues that uh, will be of uh, central concern to our subcommittee uh, heading into the next session and we felt that it would be a good opportunity for us to focus on those issues so our staff working with the SEC and and others could uh, put together uh, a set of a solid recommendations uh, heading into next year uh, that we would be able to uh, work uh, towards uh, expeditious uh, implementation. And, uh, and with that, I would like to once again thank uh, the gentleman from New Jersey and, uh, and all others for their uh, participation today and recognize the gentleman for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, certainly uh, have to agree with you that today's hearing on leveraged buyouts is uh, absolutely necessary in view of what's taken place in recent days. You know, <clears throat> on the one hand, some people can argue that LBOs permit corporations to restructure themselves along more efficient lines. Others can argue that LBOs, and particularly management buyouts, present special dangers of conflicts of interest. The public and shareholders rely on an elaborate interplay of federal anti-fraud and disclosure rules and state corporation law. I think our inquiry today should ask and should center around this key question. Does the combination of federal and state laws afford the public and investors adequate protection? As we go forward with today's hearing, as well as future hearings in the next Congress, we also should consider the effect that LBOs have on the economy. Proponents argue that LBOs permit corporate assets to be auctioned to the highest bidder, <coughs> ensuring that the assets are employed effectively. Moreover, proponents urge that LBOs replace complacent managers with people who will work harder and make a particular, particular industry more competitive. Opponents argue that LBOs divert corporate resources away from long-term planning efforts research and development, for example, and force companies to service mountains of debt. Moreover, according to this view, the <coughs> LBO makes companies extremely vulnerable in economic downturns. I believe that corporate reorganizations can improve the competitiveness and productivity of corporations. No corporate structure should be locked in stone. 
there should be a means for companies to reorganize and spin off divisions. But there also must be careful limits and restrictions on the process to prevent abuses and protect <coughs> our economy. Moreover, we must protect the long-term interests of the economy. As we go forward with today's and future hearings, I think it's important for us to be cognizant of the Commission's historical role in policing the securities markets. When Congress originally enacted the securities laws, it did not charge the SEC with deciding which securities offerings were good for the economy and which ones were bad for the economy. Some say that the SEC's role in regulating this aspect of the securities markets should remain unchanged. They cite Justice Brandeis' famous statement that sunlight is the best disinfectant, electric light is the most efficient policeman. Others argue that the SEC should play a more substantive role in the regulatory process, particularly with respect to the management buyout situation. According to this view, it is no longer enough to rely on federal disclosure and state corporate law in the context of regulating multi-billion dollar corporate reorganizations. I'm approaching these hearings with an open mind. I think it would not be judicious to come here today and say legislation is absolutely necessary <coughs> without analyzing very carefully the provisions of any proposed legislation and its effects on our economy. On the other hand, if it is shown that current law is being abused, excessive debt is being unnecessarily created, and a few greedy manipulators are becoming wealthy at the expense of public shareholders, then appropriate legislation or commission action would be needed. Today's hearing will allow this subcommittee to begin the process of weighing competing views and deciding which actions, if any, should be undertaken. I think it's an important hearing, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to working with you at this hearing and in future hearings and yield back the balance of my time. I thank the uh, gentleman very much. The gentleman's time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Sinar. Thank you, and, uh, and happy holidays to you and everyone else. For the s past several years during which this subcommittee has explored in great detail the issue of corporate mergers and acquisitions and buyouts, I've approached the issue very skeptically and <coughs> really have not made a call for whether or not there should be this kind of activity or whether or not it helps or harms our economy. I basically tended to believe that congressional interference in this area, save uh, a few changes in the Williams Act, is really unwarranted. However, it is very clear that with the increasing frequency of these going private deals, that it's time for Mike Siner to take a second very serious look at it. Now, without passing judgment on whether or not today's corporations are too leveraged, and what that means for the economy, I'm concerned about some fundamental issues of fairness in management buyouts. The threshold question in my mind is how a manager of a company who has a fiduciary responsibility to his or her shareholders can act in the interest of those shareholders when participating in a going private deal. Now where are the checks and balances? Are the fairness letters really serving that purpose? And how can those letters be fair or independent when the people who are preparing them have a financial interest in the outcome of the deal? Is full disclosure of the SEC under Rule 13E enough? Are existing remedies to the shareholders adequate? A broader question even beyond that is, is what's going to happen if these highly leveraged companies find the economy burping or taking a downturn? What are the implications to those companies? What are the implications to the banks that may be financing these deals? And what are the implications to the employees and the communities where these corporations exist? I look forward to working with the SEC and Chairman Reuter to see if there is a need for legislation in this area. I'm pleased to learn that the SEC is undertaking a fact-finding effort on LBOs. I hope that some of the issues raised in today's hearing will be considered for inclusion in this study. And uh, I offer my assistance in any way I can. Thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Oklahoma's time has expired. The chair recognizes the ranking minority member of the full committee, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Lent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> and I want to commend you for uh, 
I want to commend you for holding today's hearings on leverage buyouts. Uh, LBOs have become the focus of a great deal of attention and a lot of rhetoric. We hear a lot of conflicting opinions about them, and I think it's appropriate for this subcommittee to begin sorting out the facts from the hyperbole. As some critics say, for example, that LBOs present a grave risk to the long-term economic health of our nation, and on the other hand, fans of LBOs claim that LBO successes far outweigh the failures, and among the benefits are reinvigorated companies that have regained a sharp competitive edge. For example, Avis, Safeway Stores, and Kane Chemical are all regarded as LBO success stories. And therefore, I think we should examine LBOs in detail before we decide that something is wrong and must be fixed. I'm old enough to remember when the big debate on mergers and corporate restructuring centered on the issue uh, and the evils of bigness. Opponents of mergers used to say that it was bad for big companies to merge into mega corporations and huge conglomerates. Opponents used to say the government should limit the formation of these conglomerates. Today we are looking at the flip side, wherein LBOs and MBOs often result in the breaking up of these conglomerates. And it's ironic that some of the critics of big mergers and conglomerates of a few years ago are now out there criticizing the breakup and sell-off of these huge companies. Apparently to some, reducing corporate concentration is all right only if it's done by the Justice Department and not by the actions of the marketplace. <clears throat> Today we are off to an auspicious beginning which I trust will be fair-minded and balanced with all sides being heard. We ought not overlook the economic benefits that result from reinvigorating large established corporations that may have grown a bit lazy or sluggish. Our society appreciates the risk-taking inherent in venture capital operations. Buyouts might be viewed in a similar light as a risky but beneficial opportunity for the industrial rebirth of firms that may not be living up to their full potential. I trust that our inquiry as it progresses will listen to business executives and other witnesses who can give first-hand testimony about successful LBOs. We need to understand how a firm taken private or spun off in an LBO or an MBO uh, may result in increased productivity, uh, management impro improvements, and other benefits that were not feasible under previous ownership strict structures. Before we decide whether any new securities laws are needed, we ought to carefully examine the existing legislative and regulatory framework. MBOs and LBOs may already be among the most intensely regulated transactions in our economic system. Firms undergoing management buyouts must meet substantial SEC filing requirements. The federal securities law offer important disclosure and anti-fraud protections to the public. I want to be sure that the federal securities laws ensure that shareholders have the requisite material information on which to base their investment decisions. I want to be sure that corporate officers and directors are meeting their fiduciary responsibilities under the state corporate laws. I'm not one of those convinced that LBOs constitute some impending disaster about to swallow us up in some supposed economic sinkhole. In my view, the LBO is a corporate reorganization that allows assets to be auctioned for their highest and best use. The benefits of the free market provide us with a standard of living that people living under the failed, planned economies cannot even imagine. Certainly, investors in the public must be protected from abuses, but I think that those who want to throw a monkey wrench into the operations of the free market have the burden of proof to de demonstrate why such restrictions are needed. It is they who must demonstrate the economic and social harms that LBOs cause. I can't help being reminded of the last time anti-takeover legislation was actively being considered by a sister committee, Ways and Means, just before the October 19th stock market break. After the dust from Black Monday had settled, the Brady Commission, which investigated its causes, said Congress was, at least in part, to blame. There are several things that Congress might constructively consider. Number one, eliminating the tax code's incentive for borrowing, not by abolishing the deduction for interest payments, but by abolishing the excessive taxation of dividends on stock, which are taxed twice, once at, as corporate profits and again as income to shareholders. 
The second, reducing the effect of U.S. tax rates on U.S. corporations and making them more in line with those in other industrialized nations. And third, cutting the capital gains rates as suggested by President-elect George Bush to make equity more attractive to investors. I do not question the motives of those who urge the swift implementation of restrictions on LBOs, but I think we ought to take the advice offered by the New York Times on November 28, 1988, quote, until there is hard evidence that leverage buyouts truly weaken the economy, such efforts may be premature, unquote. In other words, Mr. Chairman, if it ain't broke, let's not try to fix it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the uh, gentleman very much for his opening statement. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Eckert, for an opening statement. I thank the chairman and uh, do very much appreciate this opportunity for the uh, chairman to be with us today. Uh, I think some fundamental questions have to be asked about what's transpiring in the, uh, in the last the last several years in the financial marketplace, both nationally and, and internationally as relates to leverage buyouts and certainly foreign participation uh, uh, in, in takeover activities of assets here in the United States. And uh, Mr. Chairman, of course, will resist the temptation to talk a whole lot about what happened, uh, what was announced yesterday at, uh, uh, at 530, but uh, as relates to Drexel, but clearly that is a component of it because if one of the major financiers of leverage buyouts now owes the government a hefty sum, we have to, we have to question their ability to continue to participate uh, uh, at that level. I think just basically the questions I think that need to be addressed over the next, uh, next several months is who profits? Who benefits? How many jobs are created? How has our economic base been broadened? How have we become more competitive? What research, as a component of research and development, other than that prepared by lawyers and accountants and financial analysts, uh, has helped enrich this nation? How have new technologies been applied? From my perspective, and I'm waiting as others are to be educated by this, as what we have witnessed in the last uh, 16 months has just been the most ferocious kind of corporate cannibalism imaginable. I'm hard-pressed to find out how many new jobs have been created for the unemployed in northeastern Ohio as a result of leveraged buyouts or foreign takeovers. I'm hard-pressed to apply a form of economic Darwinism that says only the very wealthy or the deeply in debt can survive today without any perspective as to what the self-inflicted wounds that they choose to save themselves by will mean to them in future long-term stays in America's economic hospitals. I'm not yet convinced that this is truly any level of shareholder protection, but really nothing more than special enrichment for a select few. Mr. Chairman, I think that uh, we uh, have become like some uh, in the nation or in the world uh, seeking to solve the problem of uh, overpopulation by eating our young. Economically, that's what we are doing here in a wide variety of circumstances. No, not all leveraged buyouts or, or private taking back of previously publicly taken companies are bad, and certainly not all takeovers, uh, whether uh, friendly or otherwise, are, are bad as well. But I am deeply concerned about the economic direction that's going on. I am equally concerned about the kind of administration appointments that we will see. Uh, somebody walk over to the Justice Department and wake up Rip Van Winkle, tell him there's been a lot of sleeping going on the last eight years. And it's about time we have someone who fully understands the meaning of what it's, it's about to head the antitrust <coughs> division of the Department of Justice. I'm not sure that we need a whole lot of new laws, Mr. Chairman. I think perhaps a number of the old laws that are on the books right now are sufficient to deal with it. But frankly, we have taken deregulation to an extreme and said uh, to investors across the world, uh, you know, let the investor beware. That's perhaps an appropriate... Uh, appropriate tone for those who have the ability, or as we discovered in the last 24 hours, the inside information to, to profit, both either personally or individually from it. Mr. Chairman, I think I see a lot of storm clouds on the horizon. I'm not sure that I'm prepared to break out an umbrella today, or to tell you that we ought to move to drier climes. But I am submitting to you that unless the Congress 
and the new administration, of which I have more confidence, parenthetically, than the previous administration, is prepared to at least enact or to, to at least to, to live within the laws that have, have I think, worked uh, marginally well for, for a number of years, uh, that we are going to surrender only further control over our economic destiny to those who perhaps don't have as much of a financial or patriotic interest in it as, uh, as perhaps we do. I thank you for this opportunity, and I look forward to participating in the extended discussions in this matter. The uh, gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Oxley, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, commend you on the uh, hearing today and uh, welcome for the second time uh, Chairman Reuter to a, another subcommittee hearing of the Energy and Commerce uh, Committee. After all, what would the holidays uh, be without a, an in-depth study of LBOs? I hope you've got your Christmas shopping uh, completed, uh, Ch Mr. Chairman, because uh, and all of the folks who uh, gather here today. And nevertheless, uh, the matter is on the minds of a lot of uh, people, as you well know. The recent furor over the RJR and Nabisco buyout has touched a chord in many policymakers, and I believe Chairman Reuter's testimony uh, today is the most appropriate starting place for us to begin looking at the entire uh, management uh, LBO and management buyout issue. As this committee well knows, merger and acquisition activity has been on the steady rise, both in numbers and in total price. In 1987 alone, there were $225 billion in mergers and acquisitions, and a significant number of these were hostile takeovers. More, moreover, LBOs and MBOs are of significant concern due to the massive amounts of debt uh, generated by them. I will be interested to learn Chairman Reuter's views on whether or not debt constitutes too great a proportion of the financing for LBOs, especially in the RJR and Nabisco case, and perhaps others. I will also be interested to hear the Chairman's views on management buyouts and what seemed to be, uh, at least uh, at first blush, uh, an inherent uh, conflict of interest in these situations. On the one hand, the management of a company has a fiduciary responsibility to maximize shareholders' investment. On the other hand, management involved in MBOs are naturally trying to get the best deal for themselves and their financial backers. How can these two functions balance out? Finally, I think it is important that the committee try to focus on the long-term as well as the short-term impact of leveraged buyouts. We have heard how LBOs may reduce federal revenues, displace workers, amass huge amounts of debt, and dictate nearsighted corporate governing decisions. But these are all consequences in the short run. As for the long term, it is still unclear whether LBOs and MBOs are detrimental to the economy and society as a whole. I'm confident these hearings will help us answer some of our questions. Again, Mr. Chairman uh, and Chairman Reuter, uh, we look forward to uh, your response and to uh, dealing with these very, very difficult uh, questions. Great. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman's time has expired. We now turn to our opening uh, and our only witness today, uh, David Reuter. The <coughs> Uh, chairman of the Securities Exchange Commission. And uh, it just so happens uh, that uh, the chairman of the Securities Exchange Commission is appearing before us uh, the morning after uh, the uh, announcement of, um, of the Drexel Burnham Lambert uh, settlement with the Justice Department um, and with the uh, U.S. Attorney in uh, New York. and. Uh, uh, and uh, I have spoken to the chairman uh, this morning, and it is his um, considered judgment that it would not be appropriate for him to uh, make any comment on uh, that proceeding at this time uh, because it has not yet been concluded and still involves a significant SEC role before uh, it is, in fact, uh, brought to uh, completion. And so I think uh, it would be appropriate for our subcommittee to respect his wishes and to uh, avoid uh, any questions on that subject uh, so that we can respect the, uh, uh, the uh, opinion of the chairman that uh, it would be in the best interest of the SEC being able to pursue that case in a manner consistent with uh, his judgment. So we turn to you, Mr. Chairman, and we uh, look forward to your testimony. We uh, very much appreciate your uh, willingness to testify at this uh, time of the year. Uh, most other people are out Christmas shopping, uh, probably right now including a lot of investment bankers who are looking at uh, different uh, uh, 
uh, corporations in the country uh, that they might like to uh, gift wrap. Uh, and uh, perhaps you could, uh, and you feel comfortable, just begin your testimony, take as much time as you want. Thank you, Chairman Markey. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to present uh, my views on important issues associated with uh, leveraged buyouts and management buyouts and to advise the subcommittee of the actions the Commission has taken and will be taking to provide for adequate investor protection in connection with these transactions. It's appropriate, I think, that we should cap off a, an extremely busy uh, year 1988 uh, with this testimony and focus on uh, important matters that are likely to occupy a significant portion of our time in 1989. Uh, we have I prepared a uh, lengthy statement which I asked to be included in the record. Uh, objection will be included in the record in its entirety. Thank you, and I appreciate uh, the Chair's statement regarding the uh, Drexel Burnham Lambert matter. It, it is in the best interest of the Commission that uh, I make no comments on that matter. Uh, the issues to be addressed in the LBO area are wide ranging uh, in light of the very different types of transactions. Uh, that employ the leverage buyout financing technique and the many classes of investors uh, in these transactions. Uh, uh, of obvious concern to the Commission and to the subcommittee is the interest of shareholders uh, in, manage management led, in management led uh, leverage buyouts. The Commission has focused at least since 1975 on the issue uh, of management led buyouts and it is concentrated on the conflicts of interests and inter informational advantages of management in dealing with their own shareholders. And the Commission has adopted an extensive disclosure scheme to address these issues. Commission Rule 13E3 is that rule, and it has served to provide shareholders with information they need to assess the fairness of the transaction. In so doing, these shareholders will then have an opportunity to address um, management conflict of interest questions under state law. And this area does involve questions of the appropriate jurisdiction uh, between the federal and state governments, and one, uh, an area of great importance. In addition, since the adoption of the rule, uh, these, these state laws, I think, have served to provide shareholders with greater substantive and procedural uh, protections. Uh, my written testimony contains uh, a, a, an examination of the law, particularly in Delaware, uh, indicating, uh, I think, a, an extensive set uh, of protections under that law. The Commission staff has been monitoring the state law developments, and it will continue to monitor these developments and con consider whether uh, Commission rulemaking proposals would be appropriate. Uh, we are considering a number of matters, uh, some of which uh, uh, you ch touched on, Chairman Mark Markey, including the possibility of expanding the scope of the Rule uh, 13E3 uh, beyond the management transactions uh, and into all uh, transactions in order to ask whether there should be uh, disclosures of the nature uh, and limitations of an issuer or, its, or an affiliate's fairness uh, assessment. Uh, the investor protection concerns, of course, go beyond the interests of shareholders. Uh, recent developments have indicated that the subject company's bondholders are also at risk in these transactions. Our staff will be examining current disclosure requirements to ascertain whether bondholders are receiving adequate and timely disclosure concerning the possibility that a leveraged transaction might occur. Other areas that will be the subject of attention are the adequacy of disclosures to investors in LBO debt or in financial institutions or retirement plans, including ESOPs, that is, disclosures to investors uh, or uh, institutions that invest in the LBOs. Uh, the Commission will also be gathering data on LBOs to allow the Commission, Congress, and other policy ma makers to assess the economic implications of the buyout, leverage buyout phenomenon. We at the Commission look forward to working with Congress in the upcoming months on these important issues. Uh, I will be pleased to answer questions, uh, but I should, of course, indicate that the testimony is my own uh, and that not that of the
commission uh, or the commissioners. Thank you. I, uh, I thank the chairman very much for his opening statement. And uh, we'll now move to a round of questions. And the chair recognizes itself for uh, that purpose. Uh, I'd like to uh, spend my first round, Mr. Chairman, talking about fairness opinions and the uh, adequacy of protection for all parties uh, that would be involved in these type of transactions. Uh, you state in your written testimony uh, that, quote, the, the fairness opinion of a financial advisor serves as one of the primary factors underpinning a board's fairness determination and that shareholders accord a great degree of weight to the fact that a favorable opinion has been issued. Your testimony then goes on to state how such fairness opinions are developed and how the authors of the fairness opinion are compensated. For instance, your testimony states that one, often the authors of the fairness opinion, quote, will rely solely on information provided by management without generating its own projections, cash flow analysis, or other analysis of the issuer's data. Two, <clears throat> that, quote, it is not uncommon for a financial advisor to have a significant financial interest in the success of the transaction above and beyond the fee received for rendering the fairness opinion. Three, that, again, quote, the fairness assessment doesn't assure that the price offered is the best price that might currently be real realizable by shareholders for their securities. There are examples of a price declared to, uh, to be fair to shareholders which is immediately topped by 30 to 40 percent by a number of unsolicited bids and of management making tremendous profits shortly after going private through asset divestitures or bringing the company public again. These three factors, one, that management provides the data supporting the fairness opinion, two, that authors of fairness opinions get a bonus if the deal goes through, and three, that, that management and LBO organizers make massive short-term profits after buying out shareholders suggests that we have tolerated a system designed for failure. Instead of walling out conflicts of interest, the LBO process encourages such conflicts. Since 1979, we have had disclosure of these conflicts, but disclosure alone has not prevented shareholders from uh, being underpaid and others from pocketing quick riches. It's simple common sense. If you say to anyone, prepare me a fairness opinion at X price, and by the way, if the deal goes through at X price, I'll give you an extra couple of million dollars, it should be no surprise that you get a fairness opinion that says X price is fair. It sounds a little bit like a kickback to uh, outsiders that view these deals. And I guess what uh, the subcommittee would like to know is uh, the extent to which uh, you could suggest to us um, remedies for this problem, which uh, really goes to uh, the question of uh, whether or not the deals have integrity, whether the fairness opinions have integrity. Uh, what recommendations uh, specifically could you make to us that could uh, ensure that we don't see a repetition of this type of conduct? Chairman Markey, I should emphasize to you that uh, we have uh, begun a study in this area and that the factual analysis is not complete. Uh, I, do, uh, I do have some preliminary uh, answers to the, to the question. Uh, the, the first, I think, uh, is that we are looking at the question of whether to expand the content of our Rule 13E3, which is applicable only to so-called going private transactions, uh, to all transactions in which the, uh, in which the shareholders receive uh, a, uh, an offer in a negotiated uh, transaction. Uh, the 13E3 transactions are, are transactions in which the company is no longer public in the sense that it will have no more than 300 shareholders or is no longer listed on an exchange. Uh, but those two triggering events frequently do not happen uh, in a negotiated transaction. 
and consequently our Rule 13E3, which does have extensive disclosure obligations in it, will not be applicable uh, to uh, other transactions. And we are looking very closely at whether um, uh, third-party transactions, negotiated transactions, should contain, uh, uh, should, should be uh, subject to principles like those in 13E3. I understand. And well, Mr. Mr. Chairman, if I could just, you know, zero in on the specific question, which is, is there any reason why we have to tolerate a situation where those who have a stake in the outcome of the transaction are involved in the formulation of the fairness opinions uh, which are used uh, at least initially for uh, the valuation of the, uh, of the uh, company. C can well, we, I, do you believe that it makes sense for us to just lay out very clearly that any fairness opinion has to be uh, in fact uh, uh, rendered by uh, 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 an outside party that uh, will not in fact benefit one way or the other from uh, the uh, outcome of the of the transaction ultimately the the validity of fairness opinions is a matter which has been uh, a, a subject of state law uh, we at the SEC as you as you may know are uh, are charged with administering a disclosure statute <coughs> and an anti-fraud statute and we have not sought to set standards uh, for uh, conduct uh, in the corporate world. Uh, so uh, I, I can tell you that uh, my own view is that at state law uh, I think there is developing and will develop a body of law which will look very carefully at the question of whether these fairness opinions are, um, are brought, uh, brought forward by independent uh, people. And that question is one I think, which goes to the uh, fiduciary obligations of management. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we, in our, in, our, in our going private 13E3 rules, require extensive disclosure of the question of, of independence. We ask all of the kinds of questions and insist upon um, a disclosure of uh, the kinds of compensation which are being received and the factors that are being looked at uh, and the methods of analysis. So uh, uh, it, it may be frustrating to think that in some cases uh, the state law fiduciary concepts uh, do not somehow require uh, the analysis uh, of the independence that uh, we, we may think is desirable, but uh, uh, it, it is probably going to be a slow process in the state law area to develop the concepts right. that will force what I think is desirable the conduct. And that's the point, Mr. Chairman, that it will be a slow process. Uh, and the uh, question, I'm sure, which um, has now been uh, raised across the country uh, by the great national attention that uh, the RJR Nabisco case has uh, focused on this issue, is uh, how long do we have to wait and how many more RJR Nabisco cases do we have to endure uh, before we construct a system nationally that makes some sense? And uh, historically, as you know, the SEC just made a decision not to act in this area. It was not as though you were precluded from uh, acting. Well, in, uh, not, in rec not recently. We are looking at the question of right. the extension of uh, Rule 13E3 disclosure concepts. Right. It was in 1975 that the commission decided not to take, uh, uh, not to move directly into this area when we did adopt our, right. our, our, our what rule. Saying. Uh, what our, I'm saying is yeah. I think that there is now ample uh, uh, reason for the SEC to, con to reconsider that earlier decision. Uh, uh, history has moved on, circumstances have changed. Uh, the problems of the 70s are not the problems of the late 80s and early 90s. And uh, my, my uh, real sense is that it is now a national issue. It is something that really does need uh, a, a policy established uh, across the country. And that we really can't wait for case law or uh, 50 separate legislator, leg, legislatures to act because it leaves too large of a loophole that has been identified clearly 
uh, and uh, those who have the power and the expertise are basically uh, certifying that it is a problem at this point in time. The, 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 the problem uh, is very difficult. I, I, must, uh, I, I will tell you that we are looking at the <coughs> question of whether to impose greater standards or different standards in connection with the fairness opinions, and it is a subject matter which we will be looking at very carefully. But I, I must emphasize again that, that there is this fundamental question of whether the, secure, the federal securities laws should, should invade uh, the corporate, the corporate governance and fiduciary duty area. It is, a, it is a matter of great seriousness, which I think the Congress ought to look at very carefully before right. uh, moving in that direction. Right. Let, me, let me just ask my final question on this round. And what, is, what is your time frame, then, for action in the Fairness Letter area? Uh, the, the, the matter of the extension of the, uh, of the 13E3 disclosure proposals uh, came before the Commission preliminarily. It's gone back to the staff for drafting uh, of a more extensive rule than was proposed by the staff, and we, uh, we will be uh, bringing that back, I hope, before the end of January. Other matters may take, may take some uh, longer time. My time uh, has expired. Chair, recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Ronaldo. I just want to uh, follow up, if I may, on some of the things that the chairman said. Uh, you responded on a number of occasions and also stated in your written testimony and in your oral testimony as well that you are considering certain actions well, and that your staff is looking into certain areas where changes may be made. Well, based on your staff's preliminary analysis, or could you tell us whether or not you anticipate eventually sending legislation to the Hill? Or do you think that any of the possible changes mentioned in your written testimony can be handled through your rulemaking procedure? All of what I set forth in the written testimony uh, can be handled by, by uh, uh, I think, by our current, under current law. The Does that mean that you feel that any other legislation is unnecessary? Well, I, I haven't reached that uh, conclusion. We're, we're not that far along in our, in our study. I, I would want to know uh, what the specific proposals are and look and see what the extent of our powers are and then decide whether or not we're going to send forth uh, legislation. But you should know uh, that the Commission has been looking at, at this subject matter for a long time. Uh, the, 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 the phrase leverage buyout uh, is is a much broader phrase than uh, than a kind of management buyout problem. It deals with the whole question of restructuring companies by by engaging in leveraging, and w that topic is uh, has been a matter of consideration by us in the takeover area for quite a long time. But you still feel that most of the problems can be handled through your rulemaking. That's procedure. my current opinion that rulemaking. That our, that our power under our current rulemaking procedures would give us uh, uh, most of what we need. Have you decided on anything that you feel definitely should be undertaken at this point? No, sir, I do not have a, uh, even at the staff level, uh, recommendation as to exact matters that should go forward. Rule 13E3, as was discussed, requires the issuers to disclose an unaffiliated <coughs> to unaffiliated shareholders all of the terms of a going private transaction. Do you think at this point in time that this disclosure approach is adequate, or do you think that the SEC should regulate going private transactions more substantively? I, I, uh, I had a long discussion uh, with my staff just recently about 13E3, uh, and if you look at uh, items uh, 7, 8, and 9 of the, uh, of the um, uh, of the forms and uh, instructions, you will find uh, a very, very extensive disclosure, disclosures required. Uh, the kinds of disclosures which, if they are looked at carefully, uh, will give uh, a, anyone uh, who is looking at a transaction knowledge of, uh, of the way in which the opinion was created and, and what factors were taken into account. Uh, I still do not have a firm view about whether we should we should mandate the way in which these opinions uh, are uh, are made, and that is a, and that is an area which may require 
uh, some greater attention uh, for us. But I think we could mandate those within our, our current uh, law, our current uh, Well, let's take it a step powers. farther. Section uh, Schedule 13E3 uh, provides that the issuer or its affiliate must state whether a going private transaction is fair or unfair to unaffiliated shareholders. After the recent administrative proceeding in the matter of Myers parking system, the commission determined that issuers must disclose the reasoning for the fairness statement and cannot simply present a laundry list of uh, factors. Do you believe that unaffiliated shareholders will receive adequate disclosure or do you think additional requirements are needed? I think they are receiving adequate disclosure if they, if they, if they come and look at it. I must say that the, that the, that the marketplace tends to provide some um, uh, uh, some discipline in this area, and that uh, if these disclosures are made to the market and the company is so-called put into play by the leveraged buyout uh, approach, <coughs> you may find other people coming in and uh, and uh, making bids to the point that the sh that the shareholders' interests are handled in that direction. Well, do you feel that the protections of the rules should apply to other persons as well? For example, let me give you an example. In situations like the highly publicized RJR uh, Nabisco buyout, KKR was a successful bidder. Assuming that KKR was not an affiliate of the issuer, it probably would not have to file a Schedule 13E3. Is that the appropriate result? That KKR would have to, uh, uh, would be... Would not have to file. Would not have In to other file. Words, should the protections of the rule apply to other persons as well? Should it be broadened? Or do you think it's adequate, uh, and I'm talking about Rule 13E3, is it adequate the way it is? Well, just to be sure what we're talking about, uh, uh, there, there are really two questions which are raised, and that is, um, who has to make the disclosure? In that case, you're, talk <coughs> you're talking with a question about whether not only management has to make a disclosure, but whether a third party, <coughs> excuse me, must make that kind of disclosure. Uh, that is a question uh, which we have not addressed at this point. Uh, it is a matter which would normally be in our, in our tender offer legislation uh, and rules, and we have not gone that far uh, in our tender offer rules. Uh, the question of what kinds of transactions management must make these disclosures is a, is a different set of inquiries, and in that, in that area we are looking very carefully at the question of whether these kinds of disclosures should extend beyond the going private transaction into all negotiated transactions. That in, in, this, in the RJR and Nabisco situation, <coughs> extension of the Rule 13E3 principles would require those negotiations to be disclosed by management and would accomplish, the, the, uh, accomplish what I think you're talking about. All right, let me give you a broader question. Do you believe that existing bondholders need any special protections from corporate reorganizations like LBOs, or are current disclosure requirements adequate? One of the things that we are looking at is whether or not we should, we should draft a rule which would require uh, more extensive disclosures to bondholders at the time of sale regarding uh, the plans of the company uh, for the future. The problem with the sale of investment grade debt to bondholders uh, is that there is an assumption, I think, in the transaction uh, that the company will maintain its current attitudes towards its balance sheet. And the question that we're wrestling with is whether or not to require at the time of sale that the company reveal any plans it may have to change the fundamental characteristics of its company. And I, I would favor that. I have two short questions. So far, everything I've asked, you responded in effect by saying you're looking into. You responded to Chairman Markey's question by saying that you should complete this inquiry or uh, staff analysis by the end of January. On just one point, sir. On just one point. On just one point. Yes. When do you expect to complete everything and, in effect, institute any possible rulemaking? I do not have a present schedule, but I can. I the the scope of the inquiry which we are making, including a substantial factual analysis, uh, and 
uh, resulting rulemaking would normally take several months. And I, I would not expect that we will be engaged in, in, um, in uh, formal rulemaking procedures before the, end of, uh, uh, before the end of February. But I can't even give you that schedule. But that's at least a tentative ballpark figure. The we would probably be looking at March before we had things before the commission. I better not ask you any more questions. It keeps getting later. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will say that uh, uh, during the last Christmas period, uh, 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 the, the Christmas period before the beginning of 1988, uh, substantial numbers of my staff were engaged in the market break study, and I'm not inclined to uh, play Scrooge for two years in a row, and I'm, I've, uh, I will not be asking the staff to begin a really a mammoth uh, efforts until after the first of the year. Now let me ask you this final question. Can institutional investors protect themselves by requiring that the bonds be collateralized by employing sink sinking funds or using other covenants? Well, you're probably aware of the publicity with the so-called poison puts. Uh, the question is whether um, uh, institutional investors in dealing with... Uh, yeah, as long as you mention that, why don't you give us your views on poison put bonds? Well, I think uh, uh, it's a contractual matter, and uh, if, uh, if uh, the institutional investors are going to be as uh, clever and sophisticated as, uh, as we make them out to be, then I think uh, they owe it to themselves to negotiate uh, these bond sales in ways which protect themselves against, uh, against events. So uh, uh, well, I That's really, one area you're not going to get into. Uh, well, we may require disclosure, certainly, but, we're, uh, but I don't think we're going to get, we're going to get into mandating the terms of the transaction between uh, uh, sophisticated uh, um, investors and uh, sophisticated corporate managements, no. Am I accurate in assuming that so far everything we've discussed, it appears to me, can be handled through a rulemaking procedure? I think so. Okay. I know my time has expired, Mr. I Chairman. You've been very generous, and I appreciate your spirit of generosity in this Christmas season, and thank you very Would much. Would the gentleman yield just yes, briefly? Yes, I'd be pleased I thank to the yield. Gentleman. I Whatever just, time I don't have. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, we're, we're, we're uh, trying to uh, uh, distribute time this, uh, today uh, in keeping with the Christmas spirit. Uh, so uh, i I just like to comment that although you're right that uh, that all of this could be done by rulemaking. I don't think that we're getting any commitment that it will be done by rulemaking, and that's why the legislative option has to remain very much alive here, and that's the point. He's not ruling it in or out, and as a result, we have to retain the same kind of if flexibility. Um, I don't disagree with that approach, but I also think we should have an answer, I would say, at any later hearing, probably by the end of February, as to exactly where you stand, uh, on a, or at least a little uh, a firmer answer to many of the questions that I've asked. Uh, I, I think that's a fair. I think that's a fair request. Uh, I would like to emphasize that that the commission is dedicated to investor protection, and we are charged with that responsibility. So that you, you should expect that we will be looking at these questions uh, with with great care. Uh, and I do believe that we have reposed in our commission uh, the expertise to deal with uh, with these with the investor protection areas. So, and I we will be back. We will be uh, addressing them and making some conclusions and recommendations for rulemaking. Yeah. And, and if I may, just to compliment you for the work that your staff did do over the last Christmas uh, holidays and the work that the Brady Commission did during the same period of time. And I would like to. Once again, note that uh, I think this subcommittee uh, very largely uh, agreed with the recommendations which you made, and we believe they were very timely, and we believe that the problems which you identified in the Brady Commission are, are still out there, unresolved, and uh, you provided a great uh, public service by uh, putting your staff to that work at that time. And the fact that there was an inability uh, within the administration to uh, co coordinate and and getting behind this, uh, those kind of recommendations, I think, is separate and apart from the worthiness of the endeavor. And I think the important public service your staff was providing. Um, gentleman's time has expired. The chair rec recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Sinar. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Ed. Mr. Ed. <laughs> Mr. Markey. <laughs> um, Mr. Rear, let me ask you one question. How many uh, instances 
Uh, do you have uh, 13 E3 filings where the LBO's situation where management had an equity interest in it? Do we have many, uh, many, many filings like that? Yeah, how many filings? Oh, I can't give you a number. There, there are substantial numbers of, uh, of going private transactions. In how which many? How many? Somebody know? 385 last year, my how staff. Many, how many so. cases where you don't get that filing? We don't get such a filing? Yeah, because in your statement on page 30, you say, however, in many instances, no firm agreement or formal understandings with respect to the nature and extent of the management's participation are reached prior to the completion of the transaction, therefore not triggering a... 13E3, well, is that correct? Yes, and that's one of the things we're bothered about. What, what, what's happening is that uh, the current way in which the deals are handled is to say to management, uh, we're not going to put you in the deal beforehand, but we want you to know that if you look at all of our deals over a long period of time, you'll find that management is included after the fact. But if management what? is not included until after the fact, then the 13E3 filing uh, is not triggered until after the fact. That's right. And the question is, when does management get an equity participation in the, in the, well, in the, in case the new of venture? Our, in the case of RJR and KKR, when they started having verbal conversations, you're telling me that didn't trigger it? N no, uh, it's the transaction itself so the that requires management, it. There's no preliminary filing. So that, the management the management had uh, no responsibility, fiduciary, fiduciary responsibility to inform shareholders of those conversations. It would only happen if management did get a piece of the, uh, of the transaction and then the filing would only be triggered uh, at the time that shareholder action was required. So what you're telling me is that the shareholders will never know until after the fact of, of these conversations. Well, they'll know if they're asked to vote on something, if they're asked, but asked to vote the on fact. a merger. Well, no, that requires shareholder action before the vote takes place. They have to have these disclosures. And it, they do have uh, the disclosure documents uh, available to them at the time they vote on whether there's to be a merger or a restructuring or recapitalization. So they do have it at some point, but not early in the, not early in the negotiations. That's correct. That's the right. point. Let me go back to your first page. The views I express are my own and do not necessarily reflect the views of the commission or any other commissioner. That's fine. Now, let's go back to this fairness letters and opinions. Let me see if I can get your opinion about this. All right. Are they independent? Presently, do you consider fairness letters independent? I would have to ask about each particular case. I, uh, it, it's a matter of, of looking at the facts as to whether the person uh, engaged the in the in the in the opinion is independent. All in all, I am quite suspicious in, in in significant numbers of cases that the fairness opinion is prepared by somebody with an incentive uh, to 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 go along with management. All right. It is a problem that uh, personally I see uh, that needs to be addressed. Mr. Reader, do you personally believe that the information provided in the fairness letters is adequate and complete? In some cases it is, and in some cases it's not. On the whole. I, I just can't, uh, uh, I can't answer it uh, that way. There are significant numbers of letters that do not include the kind of information which I think would be appropriate. I can answer the question that way. Okay. Substantial, if you'd like a better word than significant. In your opinion, does the two-tier two pricing uh, methods that are used in some fairness opinions give the appearance of impropriety? Well, impropriety may be a uh, tougher word than I would use. It certainly to me gives a, an appearance of lack of independence. Okay. And finally, do you believe that maybe one simple solution to this problem is to require the independent gathering of information in order to provide what you have hung your hat on, which is full disclosure? Well, the question of independent gathering is a different question than what kinds of disclosures are made. If, if, you, if you know there's a great deal of criticism being levied at the, in the management buyout area because it is said that management knows things that no one else knows. Uh, and in, in some sense, I would be quite satisfied if the, uh, if the independent evaluator was given access to all the information that management has. And that is 
uh, the kind of result which I think would probably get, get us closer to the kind of disclosures we'd like. Rather than asking the independent evaluator, evaluator to go out and do studies um, of comparative studies and, and other kinds of things. What do you do to compel that? That we kind could, of disclosure. We could draft a rule, I think, which would, which would state the, 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 the ways in which the fairness opinion should be, um, uh, should be arrived at. And you think eliminating the two-tier pricing is part of that? Uh, I'm not, I, I, I'd have to ask uh, 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 my general counsel about I'm asking that, but your I think opinion, my just opinion, your opinion. Well, you're, you're asking mm -hmm. legal questions, and I'm, I, uh, although I'm a lawyer, I, I hesitate to give uh, opinions. Uh, yes is my, uh, is my answer, uh, but I want, I want to uh, put that into a kind of a, uh, with a caveat, uh, if my general counsel affirms that. <laughs> we have extensive powers. Uh, under uh, under our anti-fraud rules, and uh, we have a, we have powers to take steps designed to prevent fraud. I think you misunderstood my question. You think I'm asking you whether the SEC has that power? I'm not asking you that. I'm asking whether or not you think we ought to eliminate two-tier pricing in a fairness letter. I, I guess uh, uh, I guess my answer to that would be yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Lent. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Reuter, uh, I think earlier one of the questions directed to you started out, I don't remember the whole question, but I'm paraphrasing it. It went something like this. How many more RJR Nabisco cases do we have to endure before you know, the economy is undermined, before <coughs> The SEC uh, takes action, and, and, and I, I wanted to just challenge that type of rhetoric and, and ask you if, if you think that some of the arguments in opposition to LBOs are firmly rooted in understanding economics, or do they have to do perhaps a little more with political rhetoric? I'd rather not answer the last part of your question. <laughs> But I can, I will give you my, uh, uh, my view regarding the, L, quote, LBO movement in terms of the economic consequences. I have stated this uh, publicly, I, indeed I stated in my, in my confirmation testimony, that I do not believe it is easy to determine the economic consequences of takeovers, of LBOs, uh, of various restructuring activities. Uh, and since I think it is so difficult to determine uh, those economic consequences, I believe that they should be allowed to go forward uh, in, in based upon uh, the market evaluation of the, of the environment. And now I have caveats on that. The most important one is fairness to shareholders and full disclosure to shareholders. But uh, uh, I, I would, for one, not interfere with the process by, by uh, putting, down, uh, uh, putting down limitations on these based upon economic considerations. Well, when we look at uh, shareholders and how they've fared in these LBO transactions, uh, you look at Avis or Safeway Stores, uh, Burlington Industries, Beatrice, Borg Warner, um, and RJ, Kane Chemical, RJR Nabisco, uh, do we do we really see any situation where the the shareholders have been uh, uh, treated unfairly? I, I mean, just look at the uh, the bottom line in uh, the Nabisco case. It seems that they're receiving quite significant profits. Uh, for instance, shareholders of RJR received $109 in cash and securities for each share of stock that had been trading for just $56 a share two months earlier. Uh, it's, hard for me, it's hard for me to, to feel that those shareholders were uh, given the short end of the stick or, or, or were uh, not treated properly. There was an open auction. The earlier bid made by management was not the one that was accepted. The bids went up and up and up. 
uh, from I think the first bid was $75, finally went up to $109. So is, is there any evidence out there uh, that would indicate that shareholders have really been uh, treated unfairly in these uh, LBOs or MBOs? The, there, there are some getting a lot of complaints from there, shareholders. Yes, there. Well, not by shareholders, but there have been complaints in the. Uh, uh, there are there are lawsuits filed by shareholders, uh, and there are are numerous complaints in the public press. Um, my view is that we have seen the development of the of the law in Delaware, particularly in in uh, recent years and recent months, even, uh, in which it's quite clear that once a decision is made to sell a company, uh, the directors of the company have an obligation to, to, to be very vigorous uh, in attempting to get the best price for shareholders. And it was that process, a uh, process by using the independent committee of directors, which, uh, uh, which I believe uh, pushed the price in the RJR and Nabisco uh, up uh, to, to, to a, high, a higher level. Uh, I, sh I should say, uh, Congressman Lent, that the at least my analysis of these of these transactions is uh, that that the the public share price of of shares uh, in the in the market is the share price for a minority interest in the corporation, and what is happening in the LBOs and uh, and uh, acquisition transactions is that some third party has attempted. To, to gather those shares together and, and obtain control of the corporation, and then once having control to realize values which, uh, which are inherent in the corporation but which the current management is not realizing. And the real question is, what percentage of that control premium should go to the current shareholders of the corporation, and what percentage of that control premium should go to those people who engage in the transaction in which they accumulate control and and attempt to make a profit on the on the existence of their control and the 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 problem for for the independent directors when they enter into one of these transactions is to try to get the price of the securities up far enough so that the shareholders participate in the control premium but not so far that they will eliminate the profit from the people who are engaged uh, in the acquisition transaction. And uh, if, if you can't be sure about whether or not the acquisition transaction is beneficial to the economy, then in my view, uh, you, ought not to, uh, you ought not to take steps to interfere with that transaction uh, uh, to the point that you, uh, that you deprive shareholders uh, of any opportunity to make uh, the control premium profit. Don't uh, some of the post-LBO studies uh, showing performance of these companies to be uh, better after the buyout than they were before? And I'm talking here about performance uh, in terms of uh, increasing uh, operating profit, uh, ability to reduce debt, and so forth. Uh, the it's my understanding that there there are studies uh, that and that the results are mixed. Uh, in, in the ideal case, uh, what will happen is that the management of the unit uh, uh, will will either change, uh, or uh, the managers of the unit will be freed of restrictions coming from the fact that they were part of a conglomerate enterprise, and that once the unit is 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 sold off or, or, or spun off, uh, the, it will be better managed. And there are illustrations of that, uh, of that phenomenon. There are also illustrations of, uh, of units being sold and badly managed. Uh, and I, I don't think that's uh, something that one ought to be uh, terribly concerned about uh, since, uh, since there's no guarantee of success in our modern economy. Do you think uh, that MBOs or management buyouts are inherently unfair to the point where Congress ought to ban them? No, I do not. And uh, some critics say that the reverse LBO uh, penalizes the company's original shareholders. Uh, 
uh, by paying too little for the shares. Do you agree with that criticism? What do you mean by reverse LBO? Well, after the uh, buyout takes place and the company is privatized for a period of uh, generally years, and then the company goes public again, very often the, pub the, the shares are offered to the public at prices higher than uh, were paid as part of the buyout transaction. Well, uh, th that, that, that is, uh, uh, may or may not be a, uh, an evidence of un unfairness to the shareholders in the original buyout transaction. Uh, it may be evidence that the company has been restructured and better managed before it becomes public again. It may be an indication of different market factors at the time of sale, but it also may be an indication uh, uh, that, uh, that the first transaction was unfair. One would have to look at each each one of those transactions uh, on, its, uh, on its own to see what opinion one would have. But you would, you would agree that it is unfair, I'll finish in just a minute, to compare the value of a pre-LBO company with the value of a post-LBO company after a period of uh, several years. Well, I don't think there are any, any automatic conclusions one can reach by that comparison. Okay. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the uh, uh, gentleman very much. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Eckert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, your written testimony is uh, thoughtful, um, helpful, and very frank. And compared thus to most of what this committee receives, it's also very refreshing. Thank and you. I must say that uh, I had excellent staff work in preparing that testimony, and I'm very grateful to them for it. Well, I would commend your uh, fully prepared, uh, your um, your full prepared remarks for, for everyone's examination because I found it to, to be, as I said, extremely helpful and, and, uh, and some good touchstones. And I'd like to plumb the depths of some of those. Uh, should we give any consideration to giving you the kind of discretionary authority? I think, and my colleague from New York, Mr. Lentz, questions and your answers indicate there is judgment calls sometimes that have to be made here of, of a formula or a test or, or a limit for the, uh, the amount of debt used in an LBO or, or MBO? I would uh, not want to have that authority or responsibility. Uh, as I indicated, I hope I indicated to Congressman Land, I think that it is extremely difficult to make those kinds of uh, economic judgments. Now, I, I don't know how one determines what the best debt to equity ratio is uh, for a corporation, nor do I know how one determines whether, whether after a company is restructured and its assets are sold that the individual units will be managed in a way that's better or worse for the economy. So I would not seek that authority. So level of debt as an indice of alone of success or failure is, is really not a relevant test as far as you're concerned? Uh, the, the, uh, the indice of, uh, of uh, success or failure, I think, could be called profit or bankruptcy. And that's the way you'll find it. Now, certainly during the early stages of an LBO restructuring, there is significant possibility of the company failing. If, if we should during the period before the company has been able to sell off its assets and restructure go into a significant economic decline, I'm sure that some of those transactions would fail. But other than that, uh, I don't think that there is a, um, a significant body that can tell us what, what the right debt levels are. Comptroller of the currency, uh, uh, Clark, last week issued some monitoring instructions to CEOs of the uh, 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 national banks with regard to the level of investments that those institutions would have uh, in highly leveraged transactions. That seems, at least to, to this gentleman's opinion, some indication of, well, we ought to watch them. W what's your reaction to, to, this, to, the, to these monitoring uh, uh, I think it's perfectly appropriate for the controller of the currency to be concerned about the risk levels of banks. Uh, the, there is a safety and soundness consideration involved in banking, and uh, banks ought not to be involved, uh, obviously, in, in situations which may er, er, jeopardize their safety. Uh, I may say that we have similar concerns 
uh, with regard to our broker-dealer firms. That was where I was going uh, next. Okay. We, we are concerned about the bridge loan financing activities of our securities holding companies. Uh, although the, the loan activities are not in the broker-dealer, uh, right. if the holding company uh, is engaged in too much risk and is injured, it may have an effect upon our broker-dealer, and we're concerned about that. We, want to, we would like to have more information than we now have. And how are you going about resolving this lack of information that you have in this arena? Since you've anticipated my next question. <laughs> we, are, um, we are working uh, with some of the firms on a voluntary basis to see whether they will give us that information. We are, uh, we are working with the, uh, the exchanges to see whether we could uh, obtain the information through uh, exchange nudging. And if, if you may remember, we introduced or asked to have introduced uh, legislation in the last Congress uh, uh, with regard to uh, holding company, securities right. holding company risk assessment. And uh, I'm hopeful that that uh, legislation will be uh, represented to Congress in this, in this coming session. I'm very interested in helping you in that, uh, in that matter, and I would appreciate it if your office would keep me apprised of, of these ongoing discussions with Thank the you. investment firms. and. Uh, is there a, there's, was an article printed, uh, the headline of which was The Coming Crisis in Corporate Debt in America. Um, a, do you uh, concur with just that general headline? Is there a crisis vis-a-vis -vis corporate debt in the United States? And is there a role for you or us in, in addressing it? The Securities and Exchange Commission has normally not been involved in activities designed to deal with macroeconomic problems. Um, uh, that, that function has by and large been played by the Federal Reserve System. And as you may know, uh, the Federal Reserve Board has been concerned about the level of uh, corporate debt in the, in the economy, um, and I think that is an appropriate function f for, the, for them. I, I, uh, uh, although I may say, as a result of the market crash, our commission has begun to be much more interested in macro macroeconomic problems, mostly in a predictive way. Uh, I think that, that we should have, and we are, now, uh, we are now having more information coming to the commissioners dealing with uh, interest rate levels, uh, debt levels, all kinds of factors which may uh, influence the stock market. And if we're dealing with a, um, uh, with so-called portfolio management or passive investment uh, in which the um, institutions are, are looking at macroeconomic factors, then we must do so too. But I don't think we should be in the management business. Well, this direction of yours is, uh, is welcome uh, by me. Let me ask, as we are awaiting a uh, budget submission by the, by the President sometime in the next uh, uh, three to four weeks, let me ask you as to the status of, of your budget submissions and whether you feel the, uh, the numbers we will soon be seeing uh, about the SEC are adequate to perform the expanded uh, studies and interests, uh, some of which you have indicated uh, today and in, and in past months. Uh, and what you see your hope for uh, the demands placed upon your agency in this next, next fiscal year. I think we're going to be friends. The, I, made a, uh, I made a presentation to the full committee uh, uh, Tuesday uh, indicating that I thought that SEC resources uh, were not sufficient, uh, that we needed to have a larger budget, uh, and uh, I, I indicated uh, uh, that I that I hope for for congressional support in that way, uh, we we were subject uh, to uh, essentially the Graham Rudman uh, uh, consequences. Although it wasn't it wasn't called a Graham Rudman consequence, uh, the the last set of, of uh, budget negotiations, uh, including the congressional action, left us with essentially uh, no increase in in uh, in. Uh, in financing for this year, uh, for the for the year '89, and indeed, uh, on some calculations, a slight reduction. And I I don't think that we are going to be in a position to to be assertive in our activities without increases in in the revenues. 
I think you'll find some receptivity to that message here as well. Mr. Chairman, thank you for being here. Mr. Chairman, thank you thank for you. the time. Thank the gentleman. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Oxley. Mr. Chairman, um, you had mentioned early in your testimony that about the Delaware statute, and I gathered from your testimony that you were relatively satisfied with the way that the uh, Delaware legislature has crafted the uh, corporation statutes. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, no, I, uh, but I have to answer it a little bit differently. Uh, the, the, the fiduciary duty law of Delaware is a court-made law, and I've been quite satisfied with the way in which the court in Delaware has been dealing with the, uh, with the takeover process. Uh, the Delaware legislature, on the other hand, is, has uh, uh, interfered with the uh, takeover phenomenon by the passage of some legislation which we have opposed in a brief, and to that extent I'm not satisfied with what they've done. So that uh, you're satisfied with the common law, but not the statutory law. Well, it's not in there's uh, the, this law, the law of, uh, of fiduciary relations at, at the state level, uh, is customarily uh, not not, legis not legislative, but has developed over a long period of time by court made uh, court made law. I, I think quite a healthy development. What about? Well, I guess I was uh, assuming that. Uh, well, okay, assuming that you're satisfied with the common law in Delaware. Um, are you in some way urging uh, other states uh, follow uh, that uh, procedure? Delaware has more or less been a le leader. Uh, uh, we have not done a full 50 state analysis of, of where the other states are, but by and large the kind of fiduciary no notions that are in Delaware are also in existence in in other, uh, other jurisdictions, and I would not expect the results there to be different. And the, 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 the single common aspect of this is a recognition that the directors and officers of corporations owe their duties to the shareholders. And I, I, I subscribe 100 percent to that notion and, and, and hope that it is, that notion is not abandoned at the state level. Indeed, so I that's a, probably the only circumstance in which I would become an active advocate for federal inter intervention in internal corporate affairs, uh, and that would be a circumstance in which the law in some states would develop to the point that it was thought that the primary obligation is not owed to the shareholders. But I'm to understand that that has not it's happened. Not, it's not happening, as I understand. And so you would not be in favor, favor at this time of any federal preemption of that. Uh, that's, that's correct. The um, evidence seems to indicate in the last several months, if not maybe perhaps the last couple of years, uh, highlighted by the uh, October 19th uh, crash, that there has been a substantial loss of individual investor confidence uh, in the markets. Uh, most articles I have read uh, have indicated that is the case and just from my discussions with the individual constituents uh, I have that general feeling. Um, to what extent does the recent LBO publicity uh, extend that uh, concern and is that concern uh, one of yours? Uh, my own view is that uh uh, is that if shareholders are looking at the takeover game or the or the LBO game uh, uh, as it has existed in the United States for the last few years, uh, they ought to be quite pleased. Uh, these uh, these transactions uh, usually end up in premiums of uh, 40 or 50 percent over market value for the shareholders, and uh, and that ought to encourage shareholders to enter the market rather than to discourage them. The, uh, the, a lot of publicity on the RJR case. Um, I'd like to ask you this, um, and there's been a lot of publicity about Mr. Johnson, but uh, obviously others are in that somewhat that same situation, and obviously Mr. Johnson did quite well. Wh what degree of risk uh, did Mr. Johnson have in this entire proceeding, or anyone who would be in a position of directing a management buyout or an LBO? Uh, I, I don't want to speak uh, uh, about the uh, RJR Nabisco transaction in 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 
detail, but I can, I can tell you that generally speaking, the, the risk for a manager engaged in an LBO transaction, a management buyout transaction, will be the risk of litigation. And he may be subject to extensive lawsuits uh, and, perhaps, uh, and perhaps a negative result if, uh, if things go very badly uh, of, for the management. Uh, of, for the management. So the risk was um, more judicial as opposed to um, financial. Is that a fair assessment? Well, typically in these, uh, in the in the large, if there is a <coughs> situation which the company gets put in put in play, uh, the management risk is is not great. If you if you assume, uh, on the one hand, they have a I think it's called a termination right, sometimes called a golden parachute, in which they will receive uh, a large amount for leaving their corporation, uh, and uh, that coupled with the increase in the value of, their, of the stock and their stock options, uh, or on the other hand, a participation in the, uh, in the, in the surviving corporation as a, as a risk participant. Uh, indeed, that's probably riskier for them than just taking their money and walking away. Because there always is a, a risk component uh, in the in the uh, LBO transaction, particularly in the early years, and I may say we've seen some of them fail. They have not all been um, uh, they've not all been successes. And it's obviously it's, it's difficult to measure success, is it not? I mean, it's uh, somewhat. Uh uh, well, if a, a company a goes into call. company goes into bankruptcy, well, I, obviously that's a I have a tendency to think that the common shareholders and the bondholders won't think that is a success. But some would say that it, it's not a success if the company uh, goes private and then is burdened uh, so much by debt that they're incapable of uh, of performing uh, R and D and other. Uh, other ways to be competitive and uh, perhaps they uh, lay uh, workers off and so forth. A lot of people would consider that to be uh, an unsuccessful uh, LBO, would they not? Yes, there's a great deal of criticism uh, about the, particularly the research and development function and I do, I do share that concern. Uh, it seems to me that, that if, if every LBO ended up uh, with the uh, research and development function disappearing, uh, we would be in serious trouble. But I have no indication that that's happening. Uh, there's, of course, another level of concern, and I think it's appropriate for Congress uh, and uh, state legislatures as well to look at the disruption that's caused uh, when a uh, when a company is acquired and there are layoffs and and uh, and changes in in what happens. My my own uh, view, which is not which is not shared by everyone is that that's probably an inev inevitable cost of uh, successful economic change. This committee, along with many others in the Congress, uh, have had hearings uh, in the, throughout the 1980s, really, uh, on uh, merger mania, if you want to call it that, uh, hostile takeovers and so forth. And when we first started these hearings, it was always, uh, it appeared to me that the LBO was somewhat of a small part of this overall process and in fact the LBOs in many cases back in the maybe the good old days uh, in the early 80s was a defensive mechanism. Uh, now it appears that the LBO uh, has changed dramatically to be more of an offensive uh, measure as opposed to a defensive measure. Would you care to comment on that change or am I missing the boat? No, I, th I think what we are witnessing is, a, uh, is part of the constant change in the takeover environment. Uh, if you look back uh, uh, before the Williams Act was, uh, was, uh, was adopted, we had a, a whole different series of techniques and, and, and it seems that every year or two we have a new series of techniques to finance takeovers. I regard the LBO mo movement as simply a progression uh, into a, a takeover phenomenon in which the shareholders are now primarily paid uh, with cash and in which the takeovers are primarily now so-called uh, any or all offers in which every shareholder is, is uh, compensated the same way uh, rather than the so-called two-tier tender offers. And that the, what the LBO, LBO transactions do in these cases is to permit a cash, essentially cash or nearly all cash offer for the company with the risk of the success of the structure and restructuring placed upon 
banks and the holders of the, uh, uh, of the, of the so-called junk bonds. And here you do have a risk transfer, I think, uh, from, from the current shareholders to the holders of the new debt. Uh, and I, the new argument, of course, is that there's also a transfer of value from the holders uh, of the senior debt, the investment grade debt, which now becomes uh, rated at a lower, a lower level. But we are talking about risk transfer here, uh, and it, it is not, uh, I think it is a phenomenon that does not necessarily need to be condemned. Well, assuming that the, uh, <clears throat> that the shareholder is the major domo here, and he is the one that uh, the entire situation revolves around, which I think you and I would both agree on, isn't it also true, though, in a hostile takeover or an LBO, that there are other factors or are there entities involved in this whole process? There are employees, there are communities, there are uh, suppliers, um, and obviously that's something perhaps more we should be more concerned about perhaps than, than, uh, your, than the SEC uh, because it takes on a broader range, a much more broader range than, uh, than you were involved in in the intricacies of, uh, of those uh, uh, situations. Um, is it, isn't it so that uh, even wh whether it's a, whether it's a uh, hostile takeover, whether it's an LBO or an MBO, that there are other players in this, that there are very important factors that we as, um, as representatives uh, have to take into account? Yes, sir. I have uh, every, you, you certainly should. Uh, my, my own personal view is that, uh, is that the, the concept of accountability and responsibility in the in our own corporate environment depends upon the shareholder being supreme uh, and the the concepts of responsibility to employees and creditors and uh, and uh, and uh, suppliers and whatnot really is a contractual matter uh, and should be handled that way thank you thank you mr chairman <coughs> gentleman's time has expired and uh, chair will recognize itself for uh, another round of questions and I'd like to I'd like to just tease out if I could because there are a lot of questions that uh, relate to the whole area of uh, leverage and LBOs but um, what triggered this particular I think uh, round of concern was the Nabisco case itself the role of Ross Johnson uh, his relationship with his board of directors his uh, relationship to his shareholders, his relationship to his bondholders, um, and uh, long term, what uh, condition he was going to leave uh, his company in uh, if he wound up being the manager. And I guess the, the question which is on the lips of most people in the country is how can we have a tax policy or a regulatory policy that encourages the kind of activity where a manager who couldn't get over you know, four or five years, his shareholder value up over fifty-six dollars uh, is contending that uh, after a, a bust-up uh, uh, of the company and and and, uh, uh, and and his becoming part owner, uh, that he want that the company will be better managed when uh, he's been managing the company <laughs> himself. In other words. Let's contrast the case where Boone Pickens or Harold Simmons or others have sat before this committee and argued passionately <laughs> that uh, they are needed in the economic system in order to keep incompetent management honest, uh, in order to ensure that maximum value is extracted for shareholders, that uh, the company is made more productive because managers aren't doing their job and raiders or uh, uh, third parties are needed to come in and to make them accountable. Let's contrast that with a case like the Ross Johnson case, where he's been running the company. He basically concedes he's not able to enhance shareholder value. Uh, he, uh, in fact, uh, constructs relationships with his board of directors uh, that are very questionable in terms of consulting contracts. He has a, uh, an evaluation of the company that, in his opinion, doesn't put it above 75 or 76 dollars. And, uh, and he makes it known that he's interested in making a bid at that level. And yet within a two-week period, he's in fact bidding himself up in the $108 range for the corporation. All with the intention of him winding up 
as the manager, as the CEO of the company when everything is said and done. So the question I guess we have to ask ourselves as a nation, does that make any sense? Do, do we want tax and regulatory policies that are encouraging management to kind of disregard what their fiduciary relationship is to enhancing value of the corporation for the shareholders? And I don't think anyone doubts that he could have presented a strategy to the board of directors that uh, would have resulted in the immediate uh, uh, sell-off of uh, divisions or subsidiaries if he felt it was necessary that would have benefited the uh, shareholders rather than himself in partnership with investment bankers. Uh, does it make any real sense, Mr. Chairman, uh, for that kind of uh, a policy to continue? And just generally, um, do you believe that uh, Mr. Johnson, uh, do you believe that the activities that he engaged in are something that we want to see replicated across corporate America uh, if our policies are deemed to be encouraging that kind of a view of what their responsibilities are. Again, I'd like not to speak directly about the RJR and Nabisco matter, since I do not know whether it will come before us. Um, but I can say that my, my opinion is uh, that the law of Delaware, which uh, was the law operable in RJR Nabisco will require the directors of a corporation once the company has been put in play or put up for sale to take steps to see that the price that comes to the shareholders is the highest uh, that, that can be obtained so that there is a protection within our state law for activities by management who are attempting to buy the company at a level which is not appropriate. So I, uh, I think that in one sense the premise of your question may be, uh, uh, may be in doubt because there is a structure in place in our law that takes care of the problem and indeed did in the RJR Nabisco case because the result was a, uh, a, a, a premium of uh, nearly 100 percent. I understand that. The, the only problem is that of course it's after the fact. That is, it's after Mr. Johnson, uh, or people like Mr. Johnson, we'll deal with a generic uh, Mr. Johnson, after corporate management has uh, decided that there are proper incentives for them to disregard what uh, many consider to be the fiduciary relationship that should have run primarily to shareholders, if that is our primary objective. Uh, and that uh, there is, in fact, in place uh, enough loopholes, enough ambiguity uh, that allows them to circumvent that primary responsibility and to believe that they can lowball um, uh, in an initial offer uh, a, a, a bid for the company, that the shareholders are reading the initial fairness letter that the management has gone out to solicit. Uh, at something that could wind up at uh, 30 to $35 below the actual value of the company. And I think that although there may be some marketplace uh, correction that occurs and KKR and others might decide to come in and to try to uh, uh, bid on the company, the real question I think we have to ask is right at the, right the get-go, are we giving the wrong kind of incentives to uh, management to be thinking in terms of what they can take out of the company uh, and that their best um, uh, strategy for themselves personally is not to think in terms of how can I invest long term in plant equipment and job training, R&D, but rather how can I uh, put together uh, a strategy that allows me to walk away with, uh, with uh, two or three or four or five or six billion dollars out of this corporation uh, working in partnership with the board of directors and investment bankers. And, maybe then the marketplace kicks in, uh, but we wind up in scenario after scenario with the corporation then being so totally laden with debt that we are questioning as a, as a country whether or not the companies will be able to withstand recession or make the long-term investment that uh, in plant in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in product development I, I don't that will make them competitive. I don't think that the, that the debt accumulation proposition is necessarily equated with management <coughs> attempting to lowball the sale, uh, the debt problems come out of, 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 of high bids. Uh, right. And the, the, the real question that I think is, is one which properly needs to be looked at, and certainly corporate management in the U.S. will tell you that the whole 
the whole takeover LBO game is negative as far as their ability to manage their corporations in the short term. And uh, there is a d tremendous debate that's going on as to whether or not the, the whole process should be allowed. Shouldn't they say, the, the theory that they advance is they should be allowed to manage the company for long-term purposes and not be bothered with the need to, 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 to find shareholder values. And, and, that, and that when these, uh, these uh, buyout transactions take place, the result necessarily is going to be a, 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 a revaluation of the way the company's managed and for different purposes. That's a debate of, of, uh, uh, with lots of points on both sides. Okay. Uh, again, you understand the problem that the average American has in looking at the uh, Nabisco case as an I, example. I I, and I don't, uh, and just generically. The problem is, is that the manager is saying, I cannot maximize shareholder value. But if you allow me to load up the company with debt and to give me an ownership piece of the company, then I will be able to make the company productive. And as you can imagine, it raises some questions on uh, the part of most Americans as they look at these uh, situations as to why the management couldn't make the company uh, productive and maximize shareholder value uh, when they had that initial uh, CEO shareholder fiduciary relationship from the get-go. And uh, I guess the question is, do, do we want to look at this as, an, as an, a question of national public policy uh, across the board or is it just disclosure is enough and if the management wants to get in that that's, that's fine and dandy and there's no... If a manager seeks to take shareholder values or himself or herself uh, at the expense of shareholders, yes, uh, yes. I find that contact, I find that contact conduct to be reprehensible. So I join you in the in the sense okay. that you find that that's bad. On the other hand, when you have a public company which is run by people who are managing other people's money, uh, there is a sense of conservative conduct which would cause management not to try to realize the fullest value for the dollar. Now, if management decides that it wants to become the risk manager of a highly leveraged operation and to pay the shareholders a large portion of the unrealized values in the corporation, I, I don't find that conduct reprehensible as long as the shareholders get a quote, fair price, uh, and if we recognize that what's going to happen afterwards is that the managers are going to be now managing a private company with a high risk of failure, and that is a different kind of company than the public company which has responsibility <coughs> to a lot of people, uh, ma with managers having responsibility to a lot of uh, people who, own the, who have, have ownership interests. Uh, those are really two different ways of looking at the management of companies. So you're of the opinion then that Mr. Johnson uh, could theoretically be a better manager at that point in time and that somehow or other the proper incentives just aren't there uh, unless he's allowed to come in and be an owner, uh, that corporate America... Oh, I think it's widely recognized in the corporate community that a, that a privately owned and held corporation allows the managers to take, uh, to engage in much riskier transactions uh, and and, and uh, risk strategies then uh, then is a, is a situation in which you have a, a large publicly held corporation. Okay, so uh, this is a way of making himself accountable. Then uh, that he basically uh, is 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 not made accountable under the other system, but he devises some way by loading up the company with so much debt and by taking out a billion himself. Uh, to now run the company much more effectively because he knows the company is uh, is in much more jeopardy perhaps it doesn't have the the uh, positive cash flow and the interest payments were too low beforehand and now that they're so high uh, he'll be forced to uh, be more uh, wise and that's the uh, that's the argument that's a pretty um, weak argument and uh, I don't think it's one that uh, most workers most communities uh, are in fact most economists viewing the likelihood of those types of companies being able to do very well during a recession which comes uh, at some point 
uh, in the future after 2,000 years of recorded economic history when we can't predict exactly when it's going to arrive, but we can be pretty sure with some frequency that they do recur in our economy. And I, I'm not too uh, sanguine about the prospects of companies the, like this the, doing well. The uh, total level of corporate debt in the U.S. at this point uh, in terms of ratios of debt to equity is less than it was in the earlier part of this decade. So that we are not yet in a position where all of this has, uh, has, has transformed us into a, uh, into a nation with, uh, with, with, uh, with debt ratios which are out of line with the past. And I, I think one has to recognize that if one looks at this total debt problem, you, you are looking at, uh, uh, at the way the economy operates and not at, as, as individual companies. I, I, you know, I, I, uh, I'd like to just n note my exception to your comments. Uh, right now, nearly 60 percent of corporate earnings are dedicated to payment of interest on debt in corporate America. In the 1970s, that number ran close to 33 percent. In the 1960s, it ran closer to 16 percent. And I'm not, again, as, as uh, confident as you are that with the number running now closer to 60 percent, uh, that we're not, in fact, uh, creating a condition in which uh, many corporations with that fixed obligation are going to be able to uh, meet uh, the problems that are created for many corporations in a recession when the sales are not there to uh, continue to generate the revenue to do the other things the corporation needs to do long term. Uh, that risk of, of course exists and the question is who's bearing the risk. As I said earlier, I think there is a great and, 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 uh, and good concern to ask uh, who is bearing the risk of corporate loss following these uh, LBO transactions. It, it, and I believe that one ought to look carefully at whether the banks have an un, un, uh, undue level of risk and whether the and, and who are the institutions that are holding these junk bonds and that is an area we are going to look at to see whether we are going to get appropriate disclosures of the level of concentration of holding of, uh, of uh, risky of risky uh, uh, bond investments. Right, let me ask this what are you uh, is the SEC conducting an inquiry uh, as to when management at RJR determined to do uh, an LBO? I have no independent knowledge that we are, uh, but I must tell you that our, our, our enforcement uh, division, uh, uh, I think correctly, uh, does not inform me of every investigation they have underway. Okay. Uh, do you think it would be advisable for the SEC enforcement division or some branch of the SEC to look into the question of when they did in fact commence? I, I don't have an opinion at this time. You do I don't not want, let me say I don't want to express one. Okay. Uh, I would, could I suggest that I think it would be a wise for um, the SEC to make such an inquiry because I think that this case can be highly illustrative of the, of the um, uh, conditions that exist in many of these LBOs uh, that do in fact uh, give incentives to uh, managers uh, to think in terms of their own personal gain rather than the corporation's own long-term gain. And if we want to ensure that shareholders are protected maximally, we, we uh, would, it would seem to me that the earlier the notice, the better for the shareholders and the bondholders. We would have to have some reasonable cause, that's not quite the right word, to initiate an investigation. Uh, that would uh, uh, probably require some, um, uh, s some indication that there was a breach of disclosure obligations okay. before we Do you think, I mean, is, is there no other way besides an enforcement proceeding in which you can look at that question? That is just there. a public policy making question that you would want to make an inquiry so that you could make some determination as to the adequacy of protections even though uh, the existing corporate managers may have abided by rules as they exist today and that you might want to look at this as a case where uh, we're seeing where some uh, corrections might be needed. We could have a public hearing, but it would require uh, uh, it would be uh, voluntary on behalf of the participants. Uh, we could uh, we could bring a uh, an administrative proceeding if we believe that there was a false filing, uh, but uh, we we normally would not uh, simply launch an invest investigation just because we were curious. 
Well, I'm not, I'm not asking you to launch it just because you're curious. I'm asking you to launch it because there are serious public policy questions which are, uh, have been raised around this case. This is a very, I think, uh, important issue uh, with regard to, you know, we're hearing complaints from bondholders, we're hearing complaints from shareholders, we're com hearing complaints from all sides with regard to uh, what this case basically demonstrates uh, in terms of how management can conduct these activities under existing rules and legally perhaps, uh, but not in full fairness to all the other uh, parties that will be affected by the course of action which they're undertaking. And, uh, and I think that it's just too much, too, too important an issue uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, ignore uh, and to put on your back burner. I think this is really at the heart of what the MBO question is uh, raising, uh, which is uh, what, are, what are the relation, what are the fiduciary relationships, all legal responsibilities that they have, and, and are, the prop, are there in place right now uh, proper disclosure requirements on, on the part of management in terms of what their intentions are uh, once they basically make a decision which puts them in a conflict of interest situation which on the one hand has them with the fiduciary responsibility to maximize value for shareholder while at the same time they're now trying to minimize costs to themselves as potential share potential owners of the corporation and that fundamental conflict of interest it seems to me has to be disclosed in a way that gives all other parties a chance to uh, modify their I, relationship with the corporation I think it's perfectly time. appropriate for us to, to monitor this area and re-examine our rules to see whether or not the disclosures are adequate I do not think it would be proper for us merely to pick a particular corporation and say, we're now going to launch an investigation as to the internal procedures of that corporation. I would, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that uh, that's, an oblig that's a function uh, which would be a very, very uh, strong interference uh, with the corporate community and one which we're, uh, we're sim simply Again, not in the business. Mr. Chairman, I am not suggesting an investigation in a way that would imply an enforcement action. What I'm requesting is um, an inquiry that just looks at this as a case. I'll pick a series of other transactions oh. similar to it so that not one corporation is singled out, but that we get a real sense of the way in which corporate management's attitudes naturally change when they are going to be the beneficiaries of the way in which a transaction uh, ultimately... We, we may be having a, a, a semantic uh, d d discussion, okay. uh, certainly a study I those hope issues so. would be quite appropriate. Okay, I hope so. Uh, my time has expired once again. The uh, Chair recognizes the gentleman from uh, New York, Mr. Lentz. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. On this issue of uh, debt, I just want to go ask you uh, if you would repeat that statement you made that American corporations have, uh, as compared with corporations in other industrialized countries, less indebtedness? You no, know, I was referring to um, uh, I was referring to uh, some uh, statistics which I have recently had before me as to the re relative uh, as to the debt equity ratios in the U.S. as compared to prior prior periods and indicating, at least as I understand it, that we are not at an all-time high in terms of debt e equity ratios across uh, the whole corporate community. And Not when you, a comparison with foreign countries. When, when one is looking at debt in the corporate sector, is it not also germane to look at what sector of the corporate America the debt is uh, being accumulated in? In other words, I understand there was a study recently that, sh that indicated if the uh, debt is accumulated in the uh, non-durable goods manufacturing section, such as foodstuffs, that uh, that that debt is uh, where there's a high cash flow. That that debt is not something that one need to uh, pay particular concern to. I think it would be quite appropriate to look at the debt e equity ratios and what is uh, what is uh, the right one, if you want to use that term, uh, across by industry by industry, rather than across uh, across uh, the whole community. We were talking a little earlier about whether shareholders are treated fairly or unfairly in these MBO transactions, and that is a, uh, a frequent concern that uh, managers are getting the company 
at an unfairly low price. I was reading, and I have here a speech by a fellow commissioner of yours, Grunefeld. Grunfest. Grunfest. I'm looking at page 15 rather than one, page one. His name is on page one. And he, he covers this at page 15 of his speech. Are shareholders being treated fairly? And that's the question he proposes. Then he goes on in this uh, speech, which is quite lengthy, to, uh, to uh, indicate that uh, the data suggests, on average, the gains that result from an NBO transaction tend to be divided evenly between the selling stockholders and the management buyout group. And then he cites uh, in a footnote a study by a gentleman by the name of Kaplan, who apparently looked at uh, a large number of 21 companies in a sample and came to the conclusion that the stockholders are doing pretty well. And the, if there's any problem, it, it is that sometimes the bankers and the buyout specialists are uh, exaggerating the value of the company and perhaps offering too high a price to the existing uh, shareholders. Do you agree with your fellow commissioner on that? Well, I, I don't know exactly what he said, but I have, uh, I would agree with him to the extent that he says that shareholders of target companies in general are doing quite well. Uh, whether the premiums are split equally between the shareholders and the and the buyers, I can't tell you. But I can uh, agree, in a sense, with uh, what I understood to be the comment that's, that there, is, there are some who believe that the prices uh, today are going uh, beyond reasonable values. And I've, I have heard uh, uh, that uh, criticism uh, in, the, in the current uh, environment as well as the criticism uh, that managers are taking too much for themselves. Well, last October, uh, you were quoted, Mr. Chairman, in USA Today as saying, quote, if market forces in the United States have moved to the point that there's greater debt leverage for the companies, then that may be the right way, unquote. Uh, have your views changed, or uh, do you believe we're on the verge of experiencing a uh, corporate debt crisis? Uh, I, I do not, but I must be careful to tell you that uh, uh, I do not have. I do not know, and I think what I'm what I probably said, since I think I'm consistent in this, is if the market has moved the debt equity ratios of our corporations to a higher level, uh, uh, that may be uh, a better indication of where the level level should be uh, than if someone uh, tries uh, to figure it out on his own and say, well, I think a certain level is the right one. Do you uh, accept the idea that some have stated that these LBOs prevent long-term planning and uh, curtail in R&D expenditures? There, there's some uh, indication that in some cases the, the breakup of, uh, of companies has resulted uh, in, in the loss of an R&D function. But I don't think that I share the the theory that the LBO phenomenon has ruined our uh, our R&D uh, um, in the United States. When, once a, once a company is taken private, isn't it uh, isn't it subject to far fewer pressures? So uh, f uh, you know quarterly profits and so forth, so that then the managers can uh, perhaps invest even more in R&D. I don't have a judgment on that. I, okay. I think one could say private companies are, are like, more likely to be able to look mm -hmm. at the long term. Uh, one could also say that a heavily leveraged company is less able to look at, at, at R&D. And I, again, I'd have to look at each, each individual situation before coming to a conclusion. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no further thank questions. You. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair once again recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Oxley. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. The chairman Reuter, before you were at the SEC back in 75 and then again in 77, the SEC opted to ensure material fact disclosure 
rather than guaranteeing fairness to shareholders as is currently the case. Uh, do you think that the decisions back then were correct? And uh, given the new uh, situation with uh, MBOs and LBOs, uh, do you think that uh, there's some indication that the SEC may return to that standard? Well, we decided, in, uh, we, I, that's the generic we, the Commission in, say, in the 70s decided uh, not, to, not to try to impose a fairness standard as such. I, I think I probably still agree with that, uh, with, that, with that conclusion, although I'd like to look, I'd like to look again at the question. The, the real problem, as, you, as I'm sure you're aware, is the question of defining fairness or defining value. And if, if one uh, were to adopt a standard that says things must be fair, then there would be some responsibility, I think, to defining what is fair. And that has always been a, an extremely difficult well, this uh, committee has had some difficulty in the uh, telecommunications area yeah. with uh, fairness doctrine, yeah. so I understand exactly what you're talking about. And uh, perhaps we've had some overlapping here on the committee uh, for once of the telecommunications side of the uh, issue as well as the <laughs> finance, but I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. What about um, the debt problem? And um, it, does, it appears to me that in some cases where you had hostile takeover attempts and then uh, a company I'm thinking specifically of Phillips Petroleum, for example, where you had a takeover attempt and then uh, was, was fought off successfully and yet left uh, Phillips, Phillips uh, in a very uh, difficult debt situation and there are probably legions of those uh, decisions um, or those uh, situations. Um, does that cause you some concern? To, uh, you know, you'd answer to uh, Congressman Lent's uh, question about that. Uh, shouldn't that be a, a, of concern to policymakers in regard to uh, the debt uh, situation as it relates to a lot of American corporations? Concern, yes. Uh, my my reaction is that uh, that it is extremely difficult to determine the proper level of debt, and I think one should be aware that when a a company restructures, borrows money, it does something with that money. Pay, usually pays it out to its shareholders, either in a form of dividends or in a form of repurchase of, the, uh, of stock. And the, the, the shareholders are going to do something uh, with what they have received. And they are going to use that cash, hopefully, to help invest in other companies. And uh, you're, you're, you're seeing, a, I think, a, a recycling of the, uh, of the proceeds of, this, uh, of these transactions. Partially, I may say, as well, to the U.S. government in taxes, uh, but certainly some of it going back into the investment market. Would you care to comment about uh, Congressman Lent's uh, initial statement uh, regarding double taxation at the corporate level? And uh, if we indeed did change that, would that uh, have, a, have policy implications on LBOs and uh, takeover attempts in general? Well, if the the, the question gets phrased this way, uh, are, are these takeovers uh, tax driven? Because what happens is that a company which is paying out dividends uh, will now, uh, instead of paying out those dividends, uh, uh, have debt. And the, the debt is then uh, a deduction against its income stream. And the result is that part of the transaction is paid by, um, uh, paid by its ability to pay less taxes. Uh, so yes, uh, uh, treating dividends and uh, and uh, t and uh, and debt as the same would remove the uh, would remove the tax incentive to engage in these transactions. So you would support that? Uh, no, uh, uh, I don't necessarily come to that conclusion. Uh, I uh, I uh, uh, let me say I, I wouldn't support it for that reason. I have always. Uh, believe that the, the that the distinction between debt and equity in terms of taxation uh, was one which ought to be uh, changed. Uh, uh, many other countries uh, have a system in which in which uh, in which they they do not tax dividends uh, or they uh, at the second stage or most, some or other treat the two. Most two industrialized. I'm, I'm un, uh, under the impression that most industrialized countries do not tax, double taxation, in other words, tax corporate level and then corporate dividends. 
Is that correct? I don't know the answer to that. I know there are, there are many that, that do not. Okay. Well, this is a kind of rehearsal for when you testify before the Ways and Means Committee, so we're just trying. <laughs> Thank you for that. I guess you're ready. We'll give, we'll give the staff another thing to study before <laughs> then. Uh, one other thing, uh, if I could ask you, uh, it, it just struck me that um, there's been a great deal of, uh, for want of a better term, media hysteria about the recent LBOs, and particularly the RJR uh, case. Um, uh, do you think that, uh, first of all, do you think that, that it's your impression that there may be a bit of uh, hysteria about that in the, in the modern media? And if, in, if that is the case, um, does it reflect uh, the public opinion or, is it, or does it tend to drive public opinion uh, by its uh, incendiary nature? Uh, I, I certainly would not want to have the press or media thinking that I was using those terms with regard to them. So I will not. Uh, I, I do. You're going to leave it for me to do that, right? <laughs> it's all right for you to do it. Um, the the uh, my own view is that the uh, what we've had is a, a, we're having is attention to a problem which has been or to a, a series of events which have been around for quite a long time. That is the uh, uh, the the leveraging phenomenon. Uh, I think probably the uh, uh, Congressman Markey is correct. Uh, in, in, uh, in looking at the uh, publicized management attitude as, uh, as being a trigger for, uh, for this concern. And I, I do think that may have been um, a, a, a part of the, of the change in environment. It's also true, isn't it, that almost every day these kinds of uh, transactions occur at a much smaller level, uh, and that in many cases, uh, at least from my own personal experience, knowing some uh, personal friends who have been involved in uh, management buyouts that they've uh, they've proven to be quite uh, successful. They've created jobs, indeed. In many cases, it would have been lost. I'm thinking specifically of a case where you had a, a large corporation that was looking at uh, spinning off or getting rid of a particular product line or a particular uh, segment of the corporation. That uh, uh, and then the management of that particular section. Uh, uh, in many in most cases, went into debt to to purchase, uh, and then in in some cases again even went into competition with the uh, parent company. Uh, not only preserved those jobs, but uh, in some cases expanded uh, and have done uh, quite well. I suspect that there are a lot of those kinds of situations that doesn't receive really any uh, media attention that go on uh, almost daily. Is that your experience as well? Uh, I, 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 it's my impression that there are a great many situations in which the company restructures in one way or the other and there is a net gain in, uh, in productivity and in jobs and uh, uh, I applaud that so uh, uh, I, I guess I can agree in general with you. And that's the real problem isn't it? I mean we, we sit here and we try to put things into uh, various categories or put these kind of strictures on, or some would want to do that, or indeed, as, as uh, Mr. Lent indicated, uh, some, I guess, would, uh, would like to just outlaw that kind of activity, uh, when at the same time, the, probably those same people are, are concerned about our trade deficit, are concerned about our competitive situation in the world market. Uh, I wish it were easy, but obviously uh, you have brought some very thoughtful uh, points to us, and uh, as we wrestle with these problems, we appreciate your uh, incisive uh, opinions, and I'm sure we'll be uh, seeing you a lot more uh, next year. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great, so. Thank the uh, gentleman very much. I'd just like to wrap up with just a, a few more questions, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Uh, your uh, division of uh, corporate finance uh, looks at all of the disclosure documents uh, of all transactions of this nature, including the RJR Nabisco case. Um, has corporate finance determined that uh, uh, disclosures were made and procedures employed in the RJR case which uh, that, that were appropriate? I, I don't know that we've had a, a piece of paper filed yet. Uh, the only document I'm told that we have is a, uh, is a 14D1 tender offer document from KKR which would uh, normally not have the kind of disclosures in it that uh, you're talking about. So you, have you examined that document? Uh, 
Hmm? Have you examined that document? Yes, sir. Yes. And it's appropriate, and you find no... Uh, as far uh, as I know, it, 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 uh, there's been nothing called to my attention to indicate that that disclosure is not, not adequate in terms of what we asked to be disclosed in uh, tender offer filings, okay. which you know is a, is a fairly limited amount of disclosure. I understand. Uh, and corporate finance is up to speed in examining all those documents? Sorry. Are you up to speed? Up to, up to date. Are you up to date? <laughs> okay. Yes, generally, they, I think uh, I, I can say they're up to speed. We're sorry that Congress gets in the way of the effective <laughs> functioning of uh, our, our creature. Um, I would um, uh, like to ask you another very serious question, I think, that are on the minds of many people. And that is uh, the conflict of interest problem uh, with LBOs. Uh, in many LBOs, an investment banking firm starts out its involvement as an agent for the shareholders. That is, the firm advises the company regarding strategic planning, investment opportunities, bond underwriting, etc. Then one day, management comes to this same investment banking firm and says it wants to do an MBO. And would the investment banking firm advise management in that regard. Now in other professions, as you're well aware as a former law school dean, other professions such as the legal profession, there are ethical prescriptions which prevent such dual representation, absent full and complete disclosure and consent. In your opinion, Mr. Chairman, should we be considering conflict of interest prohibitions either by statute, regulation, or ethical codes which would prevent investment bankers from serving two masters at the same time, reaping enormous fees from representing both shareholders as agents and management as principal? I'm a, not a great fan of, uh, of uh, strict prohibitions against conduct. Uh, I, if, if you'll forgive me, we have sometimes a law of unintended consequences that we must deal with. And uh, uh, I, uh, I think the better way of dealing with uh, that is, is through uh, disclosure and, and extensive disclosure uh, of, uh, of what, is, uh, what is going on. If there are conflicts of interest which exist, I think they, they probably exist both ways. That is, management may have conflicts and we would expect that state law would deal with the conflict of interest questions. Uh, I, it, is, it is not quite accurate, I think, to say that the investment banker has acted as agent for the shareholders in the first instance. Most normally the investment banker has been employed by the corporation and uh, and owes its obligation uh, to the corporation rather than to the shareholders directly. And then the investment banker, when it's then employed to, to, to look at what kind of a transaction is involved, may not be certain that it's switching sides. And you get, in, you get into some very difficult... Uh, I, 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 I'm, I don't deny that it's difficult, but I think, uh, well, you spoke uh, earlier about some semantical difference which we may have. I think here what you're talking about is, is really a matter of semantics as well as to who the investment banker is working for in the first instance. And, and I think that ultimately, if you're correct, that the shareholder is the primary beneficiary of all this corporate activity, uh, that uh, there has to be some redefinition then of what, uh, what uh, role those investment bank bankers play. And, well, uh, and maybe we ought to make it more explicit uh... what their obligations are or uh, are suggested to the states begin to consider that but it seems to me that we're you know as you well know as a law school dean and maybe we're all uh... basically uh... you know trained by our uh... legal backgrounds into thinking this way and we really are conditioned from our first day in law school to understanding that conflict of interest problem and dual <laughs> representation multiple clients and the inherent conflict of interest that exists that this is an area where there hasn't been enough sensitivity to that problem. And that uh, 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 as bad as the legal, uh, the legal community's reputation may be, 
we do know that there are very stringent guidelines that bar associations and uh, states to apply in this area. Well, perhaps your uh, disclosure, uh, um, your disclosure approach is one which we can look at more carefully in terms of defining some particular ways in which the uh, uh, independence question can be uh, uh, attacked by disclosure. Okay, it's. I think it's an area where we ought uh, that we ought to work together. I, I don't think that uh, it's a it's a discussion which we've had recently in the country. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of the cases, including the one that broke yesterday, raises a lot of these issues in terms of who, in fact, uh, these investment banks are serving uh, and whether or not there are enough guidelines out there uh, that, uh, that uh, prevent the blurring of boundaries which clearly have existed in many of the practices uh, uh, that uh, your agency and the Justice Department has identified. Um, I'd also like to ask you to uh, give your views as to the extent to, to the SEC's authority with respect to regulating the debt financing of uh, LBOs. Does the Commission, for example, have the authority to limit the degree to which securities may be purchased with debt financing? And if the Commission determined that it was in the national interest, does the Commission have the legal authority to fix the percentage of securities that can be purchased with debt financing? in an MBO, an LBO, or other carefully defined corporate restructuring? I don't want to uh, give any kind of binding answer regarding the Commission's authority, but I can tell you that if we attempted to do that, there would be a great many people who would claim that we did not have the authority. I understand that. I mean, I, 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 the point I'm trying to get at, and uh, it's not perfectly analogous, but I think it's, it's on point, is that uh, in the area of uh, margin purchases, uh, when an individual buys 100 shares, 100 shares of a stock in a company, he has to put up 50 percent uh, uh, of the price of those shares. Uh, but when KKR wants to buy one of the largest companies in America, uh, in its entirety, it only has to put up one-tenth of one percent of its own money. And uh, I'm sure as the average investor is looking at these uh, uh, corporate transactions that they wonder whether or not uh, there's a, a skewing of the values that uh, ought to be applied in terms of the financial transactions that uh, uh, an individual may be prohibited from engaging in but that uh, when a corporation is uh, discussed as an entity, are permitted. The uh, regulations, uh, the margin regulations that you're referring to are, are uh, regulations laid down by our Federal Reserve Board. And they are also charged with the interpretation of those regulations, uh, and uh, we merely enforce them. Well, can we just discuss it then as a, as a matter of... Uh, as a matter of principle, then. You do believe, I know, that the, the margin requirements on purchase of shares, options, make sense? And that we well, only if you put up the, uh, uh, the, the margin requirements uh, uh, have to do with uh, the, the purchasing of the security uh, and the pledging of the security. Uh, there is no prohibition against one mortgaging one's house in order to buy stock. So it's the, it's the connection between the pledging of the stock itself and the, and the purchase transaction, which is seen as being wrong. Okay. And as I understand the Federal Reserve Board's interpretation in this area, if the, if the acquiring person has the, has the uh, uh, wherewithal to pledge something else or the general credit rating to go into and to get unsecured debt from another party, uh, then uh, will not be seen as engaging in a so-called margin transaction. I understand. Um, the, um, the fact of the matter is, though, as we know, is that if an individual went into a banker and said, I want a million dollar loan so I can buy two million dollars worth of, uh, of stock, uh, the response which uh, that individual will receive is almost uniformly going to be negative. Or if he asked for Fifteen billion to buy a company, you'd get a negative as well. I uh, I don't know that that's necessarily so. If we if we look at the 
uh, active interest which many of our financial institutions are demonstrating in these types of activities. We're, we're winding up with uh, some pretty, from my perspective, pretty speculative uh, uh, investments by uh, the banking and pension uh, institutions across this country. Well, that's what Controller Clark has been concerned with. Uh, uh, this, his uh, recent uh, um, announcement was was referred to earlier, and I think it's proper for the banking authorities to be concerned. Uh, do you do you agree with the Fed interpretation that one must look carefully at the uh, at the riskiness of these loans? Yes. Yes. You do. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And I'd just like to um, conclude then by uh, making uh, one final request to you. As part of your study uh, that you're uh, conducting, I would like to just state some concerns which uh, the subcommittee has, the questions which we'd like you to include if you haven't already included them in your study. And uh, uh, first, what percent and number of leveraged buyouts trigger the uh, reporting requirements of 13E3? Uh, second, in how many cases does management stay on after the buyout with an equity participation, uh, yet a filing under 13E3 is never made? Uh, thirdly, uh, provide a summary of all enforcement actions uh, taken concerning violations of 13E3. Fourth, in how many LBOs has an investment banker enjoying an agency relationship with the company also participated as a principal in the LBO? Fifth, in what percentage of cases do shareholders succeed in gaining damages or judgments under state or common law? And sixth, in what percentage and number of LBOs do you find that corporate managers buy a substantial amount of the company's stock before an LBO transaction? Uh, it would be very helpful to the subcommittee uh, in uh, looking at these uh, uh, these, uh, this phenomenon of LBOs and MBOs, if we could get an insight through the answers to some of these questions, in addition to the other material which you're developing, uh, for us to formulate uh, policies. Um, and I might note that um, the, 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 the philosophy of the chair, and I think the philosophy of our committee generally, is not in any way intended towards uh, abolishing LBOs. Uh, that's not what we're talking about. Uh, what we're really talking about here is raising questions uh, with regard to the conflicts of interest questions which are, are raised, uh, uh, fairness uh, questions, uh, raising a, a larger question as to whether or not the existing uh, tax and regulatory structure is encouraging the wrong kind of thinking in, ter in terms of uh, how our corporate managers of these major American institutions uh, are where they are directed. And, uh, and we're not in any way, manner, shape, or form saying that anything is necessarily uh, going to be uh, banned in terms of the transactions themselves. What we're saying, though, is that each transaction ought to have integrity and that maybe we ought to look at our tax and regulatory structure to make a determination as to whether we're encouraging the wrong kinds of things. That is, that we could use the same number of tax dollars, same types of regulations, but structure it in a way in which we're encouraging people to do different things uh, with corporate America. Uh, and that perhaps we don't want to give the same level of reward to the paper shufflers over here trying to suck a billion dollars out of a corporation in four weeks as we do want to give to the kind of debt which would uh, in fact, to uh, make it possible for the corporation to make the plant and equipment and R&D uh, investment, which would make the company more productive heading towards the year 2000. And I think that's a discussion our country ought to have, somewhat obscured in the presidential debates of the last uh, year, uh, but I think uh, central to whether or not the jobs are going to be there for blue-collar Americans, white, black, Asian, Hispanic, uh, 10 and 12 years down the line. And, uh, and I think it's a discussion long overdue, and I hope that your studies can help us to uh, develop the information so that we can make the uh, policy adjustments, if necessary, uh, to give uh, different types of incentives to the same types of people to go out and become the richest people in our country, uh, but just uh, doing the kinds of things which make more sense long-term for our country. And uh, I thank you.
for your participation in the uh, proceedings here today. I think they've been very helpful in, in, in uh, focusing our committee uh, and the public on the important issues that uh, we're all going to have to grapple with uh, over the next uh, several months and years. Thank you. Thank you. Once again. Thank you. This congressional hearing on leveraged buyouts will re-air on C-SPAN later today at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 9.30 a.m. for our West Coast viewers. And in just a moment, Thursday's White House briefing announcing President-elect Bush's choices for four more cabinet positions. An inside look at the Reagan administration. Two weeks of special interviews with supporters and opponents of the current administration. The Reagan Legacy, beginning January 2nd.